Oh, God is good. Amen. 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 Some of you said all the time. All right. Uh huh. How's everyone doing today? It's good. Uh, you look good. You smell good. <laughs> Worship good. All right. All right. I, I know. I I could already feel it. The the marinating of good food happening. <laughs> Grills have been prepared the last couple of days. You could just sense it in the air, right? Oh, it's wonderful. I know on the drive home, I'm just going to smell charcoal and wood-burning fire. It's going to be wonderful. I pray all of you have a great time with friends and family this week, and this is a great time to make memories and to, to unite together. Amen? Amen. Well, why don't we pray for our time in the Word, and we'll dive right in. Heavenly Father, thank you. God, thank you for another day. Thank you for another time that we could gather together, Lord, and worship together and open your word together. Father, I pray that as we open your word, that you would open our understanding. Father, that your word would reach down to the deepest parts of who we are, and God, that we would be transformed by it. God, we open up our ears, we open up our hearts to what you would have to say. Holy Spirit, teach us. Convict us, change us until Christ is formed in us. God, I pray the words of David from Psalm 86. Lord, teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Give me an undivided heart that I may fear your name. I, I will praise you, O Lord, my God, with all of my heart, and I will glorify your name forever. I pray this in the strong name of Jesus Christ. Amen, amen, amen. Well, it's always a privilege and an honor to get to open up the Word of God uh, with all of you. I, I don't take it lightly. I love the Word of God. Anybody else love the Word of God? It, it's just amazing. Yes, yes, yes. And um, we're going to dive in. If you have your Word, we're going to turn to Matthew chapter 6. You could turn there right now, Matthew chapter 6. And we're going to go to verses 9 through 13, and this is going to be a very, very familiar passage of Scripture that we're going to go to. Some of you may have memorized it already, and I'd like for us to stand and read this out loud, and some of you may already have it memorized. I know some of you do. You guys ready? This is the Lord's Prayer. We're, let's say it together. Our Father in heaven. Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Now come on, how many know how it ends? Come on, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Come on, let's bless the Lord for his word. You may be seated. Uh, you get extra points if you said, for thine is the kingdom. 10,000 points for each of you. The points mean nothing. <laughs> mean absolutely nothing. Well, today we're starting a brand new series called Teach Us to Pray. This is a series on prayer, and we're going to be devoting the month of July to the topic of prayer, and we're going to journey through the Lord's Prayer together. And the Lord's Prayer is a simple yet powerful prayer that has some great depth and rich history and lots of instruction that we can learn to deepen our prayer lives. Teach us to pray. Well, that comes from uh, the request made from one of Jesus' disciples in Luke chapter 11. You don't have to turn there, but uh, it says this. One day, Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray just as John taught his disciples. And from here, Jesus says, when you pray, you should say, our Father 
In heaven, hallowed be your name. And this Lord's Prayer is recorded in two of the Gospels, in the Gospel of Matthew, which is where we just read from, and then also in Luke. And when you read the account in Luke chapter 11, the, it, the words flow a little bit differently, but in some of the early manuscripts, it's actually the same exact prayer. Uh, he's not giving, Jesus is not giving a different prayer uh, to his disciples here. Um, but the curious thing is that it was after Jesus was finished praying that this request came in from one of his disciples. Lord, teach us to pray. Well, you know, there must have been something dynamic about Jesus praying that prompted this request. Prayer is a vital part of the Christian life, the Christian walk. It's a spiritual discipline. And it's not one that we talk about often or maybe even value or even dig in the, the appropriate amount of time towards, but I feel like now is as good a time as any for Christians, for believers to rise up in prayer. Amen? Amen. The title of today's message is Teach Us to Pray. Teach us to pray. If you look on the note side of your bulletin, you'll see that there is no outline, just a lot of lines <laughs> for notes. And that's because our text today is simply the first verse, Luke chapter 6, verse 9, which is, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. We're going to journey through that. We're going to unpack that. There's some really good stuff towards that. So if you're taking notes, I might say something that you want to remember or something that is good for you to remember. You can write those things down. We gave you plenty of lines to do so. Amen. So before we dive into Matthew chapter 6, I want to spend just a couple of minutes kind of just creating a foundation and talking about prayer prayer in general. We're going to dive into the Lord's Prayer and the instruction that Jesus has given his disciples and has given us. But, but first, let's, let's talk about prayer just for a minute. And this will be a means of a foundation for the journey that we're going to go on. Prayer in and of itself, the topic, the subject is massive. There are libraries that could be filled with just books written on the topic of prayer. It is exhaustive. And even though we have a four-hour service today, we're not going to be able to get through. <laughs> the first-time visitors are getting nervous now. <laughs> it's not four hours, promise. But even with the time allotted, even, even with the month given, Towards prayer, we're not going to be able to, to, to tackle everything, but we can tackle some things that can really help us grow in our prayer lives. And that's the prayer. That's my prayer for all of us. That as we spend this month talking about prayer, that all of our individual prayer lives would grow in depth that we would find some practical ways to pray, that there would be some clarity, that there would be some meaningful depth to each one of our prayer lives. It's, it's, prayer is something that each one of us as believers are committed and even commanded to grow in for the rest of our lives. It's one of the ways that we connect and communicate with God and he communicates with us. Prayer is powerful. There are tons of scriptures on it. And over this next month, we're going to be going through a lot of those scriptures it's personal, it's transformative, but what is it? If you're taking notes, you can write this down. Prayer is simply talking to God. All right, we're dismissed. <laughs> it's simply talking to God. Simple. And even though we have this simple definition of prayer, it seems that a lot of people's experiences just kind of get lost at the curve. There, there are some people that are like, all right, great. Prayer is simply talking to God. But what do I say? Like, am I even doing this right? 
There are some people, their, their approach to prayer is, well, the Bible says to pray, so I'm going to pray. And it's a checkbox. And they put it in their calendar, and they get the reminders. And that's a wonderful discipline. But as we heard from Pastor Mo last week, if the heart's not connected, then it's just a ritual. And God is not looking for that. There are some that don't see the point. They don't value prayer. And then there are some, a lot of you here, that are prayer warriors. Like some of you got the email, they're like, oh, we're talking about prayer? You came prepared. Like you have a prayer kit. Like you wore your comfortable shoes. Like if we're going to be standing, I, I'm going to be able to stand the longest. You wore the pants that have the extra padding in the knees that in case we're going to do some kneeling, you were going to be ready. You know, some of you have a little bottle of oil, a handkerchief, and a modesty blanket just to be prepared whichever way the spirit flows. Some of you are like ready to pray. This is awesome. I love the simplicity of prayer is talking to God because it's so relatable. It's so accessible. Everyone can comprehend the concept of a conversation. And I love that. Uh, our son Jaden, he, uh, he was part of a basketball camp for the month of June. I can't believe it's July already. But for the month of June, he was part of a basketball camp, and he had a bunch of evening games. And this past Tuesday, I was at uh, his games. It was a doubleheader. In the middle of, of the second game of the doubleheader, um, me and one of the dads, we struck up a conversation. He, I was wearing a Star Wars shirt, shirt and uh, he was like, hey, nice shirt. You see Kenobi? And I was like, yeah, totally did. And we had this whole conversation, and the game ends. And we wish each other a good night. And that was it. I don't even know the guy's name. I don't know which of the kids on the basketball team is his. We had a conversation. We spent time together. But there wasn't any substance. It was casual conversation, small talk. And that was perfectly fine. It did not need to be more than that. When we're talking about prayer, simply talking to God, if I treat my prayer life like a casual conversation, it won't be substantial either. It won't. I'll spend the time praying, doing what I know I'm supposed to do, but then walk away and not know God any better. When it comes to praying and talking to God, there's a little bit more to it, isn't there? There's a couple of things that we should consider in this definition of just simply talking to God. Not to make it complicated, but to realize that the nature of this conversation, we should be getting the, making the most out of it because the intent and design of prayer is that it would impact us in the deepest way. It's not casual. It's something deeper. And so here it is. Here's a couple of things that I want us to consider. And I have a question, and this is all going to our approach in prayer. Before we dive into the mechanics of prayer, here's our approach of prayer, and here's the question. Do we know who we're talking to? Do we know who we're talking to in prayer. In our approach to prayer, when we go to God, do we know, do we realize who we're talking to when we approach God? He's God, the creator of all things, the maker of heaven and earth. Psalm 24 says it like this, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. When you go through Psalm 24, which is a beautiful psalm, it says, lift up your head, O ye gates, and be lifted up, ye everlasting doors, that the King of glory might come in. Who is this King of glory? He is the Lord God Almighty, the Lord mighty in battle. This is who we're approaching when we go to prayer. Do we realize who we're talking to? He is the King of glory, the Lord Almighty. He is the sustainer of life. When you go to Psalm 46, it says this, Even to your old age and gray hairs, I am he. 
I am he who will sustain you. I have made you and I will carry you. I will sustain you and I will rescue you. This is who we're approaching. We're approaching uh, the sustainer of life. He's the reason that we're alive. We sing this song. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise. He's the sustainer of life. He's omnipotent. All power belongs to him. When I'm approaching prayer, do I realize that who I'm approaching has all power? What's impossible for me is not impossible for God. All power is his. This gives me hope in prayer that there is nothing, absolutely nothing that I could present to him that he would find as an issue, that he would find too hard. So I can make my request known to God. This is the one that I'm approaching. He's omniscient. He knows it all. Nothing ever occurs to God. He doesn't discover, he doesn't learn, and he does not arrive at conclusions. He knows everything about everything, and he knows everything about me. This is who I'm approaching when I go into prayer. He knows everything about me, the good, the bad, and the ugly. He knows my thoughts from afar off. He knows the intent of my heart. He sees it all. Everything is laid bare before him. Nothing is hidden. He's omniscient. He's omnipresent. He's far and near at the same time. He rules from his throne in heaven, yet he's as close as the mention of his name. There is nothing in all creation that's hidden and nowhere that I can go that I can hide from him. We know from what David has written in the Psalms, if I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I go up to the heavens, you are there. The heavens cannot contain his glory. As a kid, we're always like, well, where's heaven? And we're always like, where's hell? But it says the heavens can't contain his glory. So however big you can imagine heaven, you need to imagine it a lot bigger. Because if that's where God resides then he's already outgrown it. (laughs) Does that make sense? He's omniscient. He's omnipresent. He sits outside of time. We measure in seconds and minutes, like, when is this going to be over? And days and weeks and months and years, he doesn't measure like that. He measures in strokes of eternity. He's not bound by time. He's not restricted by limitations. He exists outside of it. He knows the end from the beginning. This is the God that we serve. He's my healer. He's my protector. He's my peace. He's my provider. He holds the world together by the word of his power. He's not dead, he's alive. He's not far, he's near and present, fully present. He's my Lord, he's my king, he's my master. He is God. He's God, God on high, God almighty, amen. Come on, we can bless the Lord. So the question When we engage in prayer, do we realize who it is we are approaching? Do we realize who we're talking to? Is there a sense of reverence and awe in our heart when we go to pray? Do we know who we're talking to? What is your perspective of God? Have you experienced God in any of these ways? Is he your peace? Is he your provider? Is he your healer? Is he your God? Do you see him as Lord, as king of kings, 
and Lord of Lords. This is my list. You can, you can borrow my list, but you need to make one of your own. Each one of us need to have that list. If it helps you to write it down, that's great. But it should be etched in our hearts because we can pray at any time, everywhere. And when we go to approach prayer, do we realize this is the God that we're speaking to? A.W. Tozer uh, has said this, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. What we think about God matters. And this is an important first step before talking about prayer because how we view God is the foundation that prayer is actually built on. This is real important. The world we live in, the time that we live in, we have access to more information than ever before in history. We are globally connected, which is great. The world that we live in is creating a platform and valuing individuality, which is great. But then it's also not so great. It's both. The amount of information that we have access to, I've, I've benefited. I've benefited from the amount of uh, Google is my friend. I can look something up and learn something so quick. Recipes, uh, skills, how to fix something, how to build something, how to do something. YouTube U University, anyone? Right? Yeah, all right, all right. What, what a blessing that is. What a positive that is, having access to that level of information at the drop of a hat could be so helpful. But then it could also be so harmful because now we have access to all sorts of information. And the way that the world that we live in is pushing, it is pushing to shape and mold and form and shepherd our opinions, our perspectives, our ideologies, and if I'm not careful, as I'm taking in any, all of this information, it could drive me away from who God says he is from his word. And now I could be living my life with a picture of God that is not found in his word, which is no God at all. The world celebrates individuality. Man, this, is, this has had some really good positives, especially for creatives, people being able to start businesses and, and start organizations that help people, people that have been able to push the bounds of expressions and push technology forward in so many different ways. We're advancing at a much higher pace, and that's great, but it's also not so great. Anything taken to an extreme becomes sin. In the pursuit of freedom and individuality, the world has led and is leading people to become a law unto themselves, doing right in their own eyes, just like in the book of Judges. The world has elevated thought, opinion, ideology, and feelings to be the chief law that governs lives, and in turn has pushed God and his law out. Live out your truth. Be true to yourself, which comes in direct contradiction to even the scripture that we prayed earlier. From Psalm 86, teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Give me an undivided heart that I may fear your name. I will praise you, O Lord, my God, with all my heart, and I will glorify your name forever. What we think about God matters. We all grew up different. The world affects each of us in different ways. But as believers, 
We all come to the same place where our thoughts and experiences and opinions and feelings all must come under the authority of Scripture. This is where it is. Let the word of God rule over your hearts. That we would come this way and that we would come under the authority of Scripture and not the other way around. Where we try to take Scripture and fit it into our context of life. How we see things. This is the tension that we live in. That we're in the world, but we're not of the world. That we hear the world, but we need to hear God's word and his word louder. Faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God, not the news headlines. And so this is where we are. Romans chapter 12, verse 2 says it like this. Do not conform. Don't be molded. Don't live according to the patterns of this world, its philosophies, its, its methodologies, its values, its customs. But be transformed. Grow in maturity. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good and perfect will. When our perspective of God is informed by the word of God, then when we go to pray, then we're actually praying to the God of the Bible and not a picture or an opinion of God that we've gotten from the world or the supermarket aisle with all the magazine, I don't know, or Wikipedia. Here it is. What a tension that is to be like, nope, but this is what God's word says. Lots of great opinions, lots of great perspectives, lots of things out there that seem so reasonable. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I think it should work that way. Yeah, I think God should do that. But if it's not here, it shouldn't be embraced. This, this means that Christians need to have a resolve this means that believers need to have a little bit of grit to go against the stream of the world. It means that each one of us have to get to this place that we would say, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Amen? Amen. 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 <laughs> this is when prayer becomes transformative. This is when prayer becomes a delight and not a chore. My prayer is that this would stir your heart, get the wheels turning. When you go to pray, do you realize who it is that you're talking to, that you would magnify the Lord and that you would realize that he transcends and is greater than any problem, any sickness, any request that we could bring to him? Okay. Ready to take a look at Matthew 6? All right, three more hours to go. <laughs> you guys are so gracious. <laughs> that joke is going to get old very soon. <laughs> Matthew 6, verse 9. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. This opening phrase that Jesus gives his disciples as he's giving them this prayer, this opening phrase, our Father, those first two words are so full of so much. We're not going to have time to unpack all of it, but we're going to unpack a couple of things, and, and I pray that this would help. Number one, uh, our Father, for take this into consideration when it comes to prayer, our Father, it gives us direction. It gives us direction in prayer. Who we are talking to, we are talking to our Father. We don't pray to nature. We don't lift our requests to a tree, to a leaf, to stars, to moon, to wind, water, ice, wood, fire. We don't do that. We make all of our requests to God, our Father 
Amen? We don't make our requests to man-made images or stones or statues or rocks or whatever have you, paintings. All of our requests go to God. We as humans have a really great talent of taking something simple and making it complicated. Over the centuries, something as simple as prayer, we've turned it into the hokey pokey. You know, you put your right foot in, you put your right foot out. No, now you got to turn it all about. Like, prayer is simple. Over the years, they've created a directory of who, well, what, what, is it that you're, what is it that you're looking to pray for? Oh, you want to grow taller? Hold, hold on. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, you need to pray to um, this person because this person had the same request that you had. And we don't need any of that. All requests. We don't need anything in the middle. We don't need a charm. We don't need a bracelet. We don't need a thingamabob. We don't need any of that. When you pray, pray like this. Say, our Father. We're going directly to our Father. Our Father. There's no need for anything in between. This gives us direction to all of our prayers, big and small. There is nothing too big and there is nothing too small. Our Father gets all of our requests. Amen? Amen. Our Father also talks about family. Our Father. He, just, he doesn't just say, my Father, uh, each one of you have your own little thing and, you know, go into your own little... Co-. No, no, no. Our Father. Oh, I love it because we're a family, right? What makes us a family? Our Father. Amen. So here it is. Our Father means when I go to pray, I shouldn't just be interested in my stuff. My view in prayer should be a lot wider towards my brother's and my sisters, our Father. When I go to pray, do I consider other people's burdens? Do I look for other opportunities or any opportunity to pray, not just for my thing, but for others? Shameless plug. This is why community groups are so important. Because each of us need a friend at 2 a.m. that we can call and share our burdens with. I know it's not a competition, but my community group is amazing. (laughs) Oh, you you heard the cheering section. I'm just saying. It's not a competition, but we are winning. And I don't want anyone to feel jealous. But this is what it is. The text messages that roll in for the barbecue are great. And the text messages that roll in, hey, I really need you to pray because neither of them are an inconvenience when we're family. Come on, our Father, who are you connected to? When you go to pray and you're not connected to anyone else in the body, you're simply praying, my Father, because you're only worried about your stuff. But we are a body of Christ. We are a community of believers. We are connected to one another. We are not meant to live this out in isolation, but in connection. This is why our Father opens this up to more than just out my stuff. I care. I care for someone else. And I don't know if you've noticed a little subtlety of prayer. Because when you're busy praying for someone else, you don't ever have the mechanism to talk about them. I'm going to let that sink in just a little bit. You know, when people talk, if we prayed more, we'd talk less. Right? Right? Because here it is, our hearts will be in tune with the Father's heart. Because now we're concerned not just about us, but about our family. He's our Father, our Father. And third, our Father, addressing God as Father. I know that's the big one. It was probably like, oh, he's going to go there first. No, I'm going to go there last. 
addressing God as Father. What Jesus is presenting here when he presents this prayer is revolutionary, especially to the people that he was speaking to, because never have they ever addressed God as Father. I don't know about that. Like, Jesus, yeah, he's real good, but then he said, addressing God as Father, oh, I don't know, I don't know. This was a radical idea that was happening here in this moment. This was mind-blowing. There was no framework in their religious system to address God as Father. The Israelites wouldn't even write out the full name of God out of reverence, out of, out of uh, an, an awe, out of uh, making it sacred and set apart. We're not even worthy to write out his name fully. They would put in some dashes in between there. Everybody knew who they were talking about. But they wouldn't even invoke the name of God. Now to call God. Father, oh, this was mind-blowing. This was huge. But what Jesus was doing here, he was taking prayer from being ritual to relational. Jesus was taking prayer from being ritual to relational. They all knew about prayer. Prayer had been passed down since the time of Moses. They would pray several times a day. They knew about prayer. But now to be this close seemed like it was stepping over some grounds. But this is a beautiful invitation that Jesus is giving not only his disciples but all of us who believe. And it really got, dives into some great things. Father communicates to us the depth of relationship that God wants to have with us. It speaks to his intent to love and care and nurture and protect. But how is it that we can call God Father? You know, Growing up, my parents would tell us when we were younger, uh, me and my brothers and my sister, whenever you address an adult, you always say Mr. or Miss. That's just the way I, that's just the way I grew up, right? So we had lots of Lots of uh, friends and adult friends, and my, my parents were always hosting, like, uh, Bible studies and prayer meetings over the house. So we always had a, we were always around a bunch of adults. And when you're in church, you're always around a bunch of adults. And so, you know, we've had adults say, hey, just call me Steve. Hey, just call me Steve. And we're like, okay, Mr. Steve. Ah, don't say Mr. Steve. That's my dad. Say, say Steve. Just say Steve. And we look at our parents okay, Mr. Steve, <laughs> and move on. We, we, we don't impose taking on calling God Father. We don't walk in and overstep that line of overfamiliarity. We've been invited in to do so by Jesus, who has the right to call God Father because he is his son. And here it is, when we go into the term father, you could only call someone father legally because, you know, as a Puerto Rican guy, like, I call everybody pops, father, uncle, everybody's my cousin, we're all connected. <laughs> you Romanians know what I'm talking about because all Romanians are connected too. Oh, yeah, I know that guy. Oh, yeah, that's my cousin. Legally... <laughs> Call God Father is by two ways, by birth or adoption. Now, by birth, we've already struck out. The Bible clearly tells us from birth we were enemies of God, in Romans chapter 5, verse 10. And by nature, we are objects of wrath, from Ephesians chapter 2. So by birth, we struck out. While God is the father of all creation, relationally and spiritually, 
we are disconnected because sin separates us from God. So the only way that we could call God Father is by adoption. And God initiated this whole adoption. We get to call God Father because he chose us and we didn't choose him. God made the adoption possible through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. God initiated the relationship. Only Jesus can call God Father. And the miracle of adoption is when we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, when we accept by faith the work of Christ on the cross, then we can now call him Father. It's not by good works. Jesus says it even to the teacher of the law, Nicodemus. He's like, you must be born again. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but spirit gives birth to spirit. There is a rebirth that needs to happen in order to join this family. And for every believer, we can call God Father. And for those that have not accepted Christ, you're still on the outside of that family. But the invitation is always open where you can join this family by confession of faith that the Lord Jesus Christ was crucified and risen from the dead. When you realize that you are a sinner in need of a savior, you can join this family. But this is a miracle that we can call God our father. And this is now the basis of prayer. The basis of prayer is not a ritual. You don't have to spin around in a circle and do a couple of jumping jacks and then you're able to pray. It's relational. When we approach prayer, we should be reminded of who it is that we're talking to. But then when we engage in prayer, we can call God our Father. And this is a beautiful thing. My kids... They talk to me without fear. They just talk to me because I'm their dad. There's no, should I talk to him today? Should I not talk to him today? I mean, sometimes when I'm talking with some of you, they'll come up to me and they won't even see you. <laughs> as if I'm just standing waiting for them. <laughs> I'm, I'm just here for you, kids. But there's no fear in their approach to me as their dad and there's no hoops that they need to jump through in order to earn time with me. They could talk to me at any time. Parents, you know this. And this is the heart of our heavenly father. Our father in heaven. Let's talk about it. How we internalize this concept of father how we internalize this concept of God as our heavenly father will greatly impact our prayer life. Our relationship to prayer is reflected by our relationship with our heavenly father. Some people have a difficult time viewing God as father because of their earthly fathers. But this is hard. And it almost feels impossible to even embrace this truth of God as father. The concept of God as our king, as our shepherd, as our rock, as our shield, as our friend, as our savior, as our redeemer, no problem. But once it gets to father, God as our father, whoa, 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 whoa. There's a wall. I'm not looking to minimize any of the pain or trauma or even wickedness done by earthly fathers. But I would like to suggest this, that God is able to heal that pain. God saw fit to draw you to him and become 
our Father, and I believe that he's able to heal that pain of earthly fathers. You know, when I put myself in the light of God's word, when all of us put ourselves in the light of God's word, we see who we really are, warts and all. And I don't know about you, but that leads me to realize how much grace I truly need. So when I look at someone else, I can see that they're also in need of grace. There but for the grace of God go I. All of us, where would we be without the grace of God? I would not be able to stand on my own effort, on my own strength, or even my own knowledge. And that is part of calling God our Father. There's, there's a humility there. There's a coming under. There's a looking towards. And we're going to unpack that throughout the month. But here it is. I pray that I pray that this provides an opportunity, maybe for some of you. I, I don't think that this is for all of you, but I think that this might be for one or two of you, and it's worth it. Maybe you got an issue with your earthly father, and maybe you haven't spoken for a while. I pray that something would stir in your heart and that you would begin just talking to your heavenly father and asking for him to touch that place and that it would lead to a place where there would be true healing and reconciliation between you and your earthly father if possible. That's what this is all about. Connection, relationship. Some of us, God is our father, no problem. We accept that, that's not an issue. No trigger there. Even if you didn't have a great dad, earthly dad, or whatever your earthly situation was, no problem. God is your father. You got it. You could take it. No problem. Here's the concept that might be a little bit hard for some of you. It was for me. It was this concept of adoption. While I totally embrace God as my father, this thought of being adopted, that was a little foreign to me. And I had to process through a lot of that stuff. You know, especially if you grew up in church, you know, you kind of feel like you, you, always were, you always belonged. Like, well, I was always here, so God's always loved me. Like we always, you know, growing up in church, some of you didn't grow up in church, that's fine. I'm not talking to you right now. But some of you grew up in church like me, and I grew up in church, and I went through the whole VBS thing and the whole kitty church thing, and I've always had this connection or knowledge of God in my life where, yes, no, I know I'm a sinner in need of a Savior, and I've asked Jesus into my heart, and he's my Lord, and all of those things, but I kind of walked around like, yeah, I already know. Yeah, like, I belong here. Like, yeah, do you know who my dad is? Like, my heavenly father, you know? Like, there was, there was a disconnect between me realizing that I needed to be rescued. There was a disconnect between me realizing how deplorable my sin is before the Lord. No matter how long we've known each other. There was a disconnect in me realizing my need for grace because I know. And this is what happened to Israel. We see it all throughout the Bible. They, they leveraged their relationship, they became legalistic, and they justified themselves by the law and by their knowledge. And by what they did, and they were banking on the fact that, don't you know who my dad is, but then they would live a completely different life while acknowledging the law, disconnecting their heart. Jesus spoke about this in his ministry on earth. With their lips they praise me, but their hearts are far from me, quoting the prophet Isaiah. There is more to just saying 
the right things. There's more to just knowing the right information. Jesus has taken prayer and has moved it from ritual to relational, which means now my heart must be engaged, which means there needs to be a growing, learning, living relationship with my Lord and Savior and my Father. This is why the, pro- the parable of the prodigal son is so powerful. The father showed love on the younger son who broke his law. But the older brother, the one who stayed, he couldn't see that he was just as much in need of his father as his other brother. Being in the house made the older brother self-righteous. I don't want to forget. I don't want to forget that I needed rescuing. I don't want to get to a place where I think I've gotten here in my own strength. And I don't want to forget the high cost of this adoption. This wasn't just a signing of a paper. This was a sacrifice on a cross. It cost Christ his life to bridge the gap to make us a family. This wasn't cheap. This was costly. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Hallowed, we don't use that word. I feel like every time I preach, I'm using words that we just normally just don't use. Hallowed, hallowed. I don't know if we should bring that back. But hallowed means holy, separate. Hallowed be your name. Holy is your name. Your name is set apart. And here it is, this this portion in the prayer, we're just two sentences in, and here is worship. Elevating the name of God, ascribing glory and worth to God's name. Your name be glorified. Hallowed be your name. You're altogether separate. You're altogether holy. There is none beside you. Hallowed be your name. This is an acknowledgement. It's an honor. It's it's glorifying. It's elevating the name of Christ above our own. We haven't gotten to the place of giving our requests yet. But here it is. We see this mechanism of recognizing relationship and then giving worship. Hallowed be your name. Worship is an act of attributing worth and value to someone. To say, hallowed be your name, is to declare that God is on high, that God is elevated. It is worship unto the Lord. Question, does our heart desire God's glory? When we pray, is there any worship in our prayer unto the Lord? Or do we kind of go straight to, okay, Lord, this is what I need. Um, To stop, right? We all do it, right? We, we, We all run right past it. When we don't consider who it is that we're talking to, this well worn, beautiful prayer is inviting us to recognize the relationship that we have with God and giving us an opportunity to worship him for who he is. Is God's glory the motivation of our hearts? God, no matter what happens, just be glorified. Lord, Father, it doesn't matter what happens to me. It doesn't matter what happens to this outcome. Just may you get glory. 
is God's glory any motivation in our heart when we approach prayer? Hallowed be your name. Before I get to any request, before I get to anything I need, I just want to praise you. I just want to give you glory. I just want to give you honor because your praise and your worth and your value is even greater than me getting what I'm going to ask you for. You're my father. This is a great opportunity to give praise and honor and worship to the Lord, our father. When we pray, does our heart stir towards worship unto God? We're going to take just a couple minutes. We're going to put a timer on the screen. And I want all of us to take just three minutes to reflect everything that we've just been talking about. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. If you feel like God is just speaking something to your heart, I encourage you to write it down. If you want to take the next three minutes and talk to our Father, why don't you pray? But we're going to do that just for the next couple of minutes, and then I got some homework for you. Yeah, I know. On a holiday weekend, too. But let's pray. Come on. Our Father in heaven, we worship you and we give glory to your name. As we take this time to truly dig into prayer, help us, stir our hearts to remind us who you are. We love you, Lord. And we remember all of your blessings and benefits in our lives, oh God. Thank you. Thank you for making a way through Christ. God, thank you for bridging the gap, oh Father. And thank you for salvation. Thank you for becoming our Father. Do a work in our hearts to help us remember who you, who you are. And Lord, would you transform us from the inside out each time that we look and spend time in your presence. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. I have some homework. You ready? Probably not. Homework. Starting this week, spend some time with God this morning, in, in the mornings, morning time. Some of you already do that, so you're just like, got it. <laughs> then, in the afternoon, I want you to spend time, just a minute or two, and read the Lord's Prayer. Recite it, read it, but when you do, do it with your heart, with your heart engaged. Every afternoon, take one minute and read it and pray the Lord's Prayer. And then every evening, not just this week, but for the month of July, that we would do these things. Every evening, as you put your head on the pillow, I want you to examine your heart. Reflect on your day. Stressful day, crazy day. But I want you to find one thing that you can thank God for and end your day with thanksgiving. If it's that one thing, if it's, Lord, thank you for bringing me back home safely. If it's, Lord, thank you for, that I have a place to put my head. Whatever that thing is, but end your day with thanksgiving. Don't give your list to God. So spend time with him in the morning, at least 10 minutes. If you need to wake up 10 minutes earlier to get that 10 minutes, it's worth it. In the afternoon, the Lord's prayer, and at night, thanking the Lord. Amen? Come on, uh, let's stand. Amen. <laughs>